Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Josie Bouchard. I'm the Equity Advisor at the Law Society of Upper Canada, and I'd like to welcome you to our International Women's Day event. In fact, I want to wish you a happy International Women's Day. Uh, we are still waiting for one panelist, but I think what we'll do is we'll begin, and Angela Robertson can join the discussion uh, once she gets here. Uh, this is uh, one event of many events that the Law Society hosts here, at the law, uh, hosts here in the context of our equity public education program. So I hope to see you here um, on a regular basis. Um, I would like to thank our partners in organizing this event, the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic, the Women's Law Association of Ontario, the Feminist uh, Legal Analysis Section of the Ontario Bar Association and the Women's Future Fund. The Women's Future Fund asked me to announce that their annual spring fundraising campaign runs from today, International Women's Day, until Mother's Day. The front page story in the Globe and Mail today for International Women's Day was entitled, Wife Lived in Fear of Man Who Threw Girl Off Bridge. On Sunday, Mr. Amarsi dropped his daughter from an overpass um, onto the 401 and then killed himself. Nine months earlier, Ms. Amarsi had sworn a statement saying that she was fearful for the safety of her daughter and for the safety of herself. Domestic violence is an issue, is an issue that needs to be addressed. We're here today to listen and discuss with experts in the field of domestic violence. More specifically, our panelists will explore, explore legal issues that relate to women who face abuse and domestic violence and the role of lawyers in domestic violence cases and in advocacy and law reform. I will in introduce all the panelists and then I will give them about 10 minutes uh, to speak. They all told me that they have more than 10 minutes to talk. So um, I won't hold them too seriously or too strictly to the time. Uh, and then I will uh, invite you to ask questions or comments and we will make this into a discussion, I hope. I would like to uh, first introduce to my left, Mary Lou Fassel. Uh, she is the Director of Legal Services at the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic where she has been employed since 1987. She oversees the development of comprehensive services in the areas of family, immigration, administrative and criminal law. Ms. Fassel has delivered hundreds of public legal education programs and professional development programs addressing the rights of female victims of violence in the justice systems. She has engaged in numerous systemic reform initiatives focused on the eradication of violence against women, and she will discuss issues in the criminal justice system for women who are victims of domestic violence with perspectives on the role of lawyers in criminal law, day-to-day -day advocacy, and addressing fundamental social issues. Our first panelist just got here. <laughs> Would you like to be first or last? Sure. Okay. She's agreed to be first. I'll let her breathe a bit. Um, Angela Robertson is the executive director of Sis at Sistering, a woman's place, which is a multi-service women's organization for marginalized, poor, and homeless women. She has served as a senior staff executive at the Ontario Women's Directorate, Homes First Society, the Community Legal Planning Council of Toronto, and Women's Educational Press. Ms. Robertson is co-editor with Ina Dua of the book Scratching the Surface, Canadian Anti- a racist feminist thought. She was recognized by Now Magazine as one of the top 10 community activists on social justice issues and has also received the Rubina Willis Women of Distinction Award and the Urban Alliance on Race Relations Award. She will address the topic of challenges of abused homeless women and sex trade workers in accessing justice. Our third panelist will be Carol Curtis, and she is a family lawyer practicing in a feminist law firm in Toronto. The firm has three lawyers practicing family law equality rights litigation and estate litigation. She's a member of the Children's Lawyer Panel, representing children in child protection cases. And Ms. Curtis has special expertise in dealing with cases involving assaulted women, custody cases, and sexual abuse cases. Ms. Curtis has been counsel for LEAF in a number of charter cases, and she is a bencher uh, of the Law Society and was first elected in 1991. 
She will talk about the role of family lawyers in uh, domestic violence cases and insights into advocacy and law reform. Finally, Sue DeBay uh, Mashkari is counsel in the Equity Initiatives Department at the Law Society. Prior to holding that position, um, Sue DeBay was staff lawyer at the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic, Clinic, and she represented women survivors of violence in immigration, refugee, and poverty law matters. Uh, she has delivered numerous workshops at shelters and community organizations on the rights of women who are victims of violence, and she's appeared uh, before the Standing Committee of the House of Commons on Citizenship and Immigration. Ms. Mashkuri will discuss challenges in immigration and refugee law for immigrant, refugee, and non-status women who are victims of abuse and violence, and she will also discuss um, international law matters. So I will ask uh, Ms. Robertson to uh, begin her presentation. And I apologize for being late. I think we should all be committed to, if you leave the office, don't go back for anything, because you'll never get out. Um, so my apologies. And my thank you to Rudy for being persistent in inviting me back after last year. He had issued an invite, and I wasn't able to be part of a previous conversation. So thank you, Rudy. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. So thank you, Rudy, for um, once again um, inviting me. I want to, I think, begin by just giving you a brief overview of um, Sistering, the services we offer, and just to contextualize the service. So when I speak to some of the challenges and some of the women who um, kind of are confronted by and sometimes confront the justice system that you get a sense about kind of the community of women um, um, about whom I'm talking. Um, Sistering is a multi-service women's center um, that offers um, practical and emotional supports to women who are homeless, um, women who are underhoused, um, women who are senior, socially isolated, and a significant number of the women who we see are women who are living with addictions, living with mental health issues, and women who have come from histories of trauma and violence. The services we offer are both practical in nature in that it's ranging from food, um, clothing, transportation services, primary health care interventions, to um, counseling support for women who have experienced trauma and violence. Um, so that's kind of a nutshell of who we serve. Um, I think when kind of I was asked to kind of bring some commentary um, for this conversation is what I wanted to talk about were kind of what I call women on the margins of the justice system and recognizing that the context is talking about um, domestic violence is wanting also for us to um, kind of push the boundaries a bit to look at the continuum of violence in women's lives in that domestic violence oftentimes does not happen in, the, in an exclusive way um, and not in relation to issues of um, sexual violence, sexual assault. Um, histories of intimidation and threat. So wanting us to see the connectedness of those issues in this conversation. The women who we see, who I would say are women at the margins, are homeless women, um, women who are living on the street, women who are using the hostel and shelter system, who do not have what we call an address and or this place called home. Um, we also see the women who are also at the margins in trying to access justice system um, remedies are women who are living with mental illness, whose sometimes issues are compounded by the issues of their poverty and issues of homelessness. Um, and another group of women who we have seen systematically um, at either sides of the justice system are women who are involved in sex trade, um, women who are involved in um, selling sex um, to support themselves, and or women who are victimized and caught in the barter of sex for basic needs. A larger group of women who we are seeing at the margins are senior socially isolated women, who are women who are experiencing what is coined elder abuse and what in the context of this conversation I would say is violence against women. 
Um, so these are senior women who are experiencing violence at the hands of their partners, their spouses. And it is not just the kind of abuse where one would say, well, it's the cantankerous seniors who have grown old together and are no longer able to stand one another. Um, it is physical assault, it is sexual assault, and it is violence against women. So wanting also that to, bring, to be part of this conversation. The other group of women who I would signal as women who are at the margins are poor racialized immigrant women um, for whom English is not a first language. And that as a result of that, it compromises their access to not just um, community-based services and basic need services, but when the issue of a crime is presented is then it's comp it compounds their access to this thing called, that we call justice. And I know that we have 10 minutes, so I'm only supposed to flag all of the issues and then leave it all for a conversation. So I'll try to do that. Um, so when we look at what are some of the barriers and challenges, the challenges for this group of women, I don't think I would say begin with accessing the court system. I would say it precedes that in that it's accessing support and intervention around the police intervention. So I think some of the barriers and challenges begin there. Some of the barriers and challenges begin in that when you're looking at the feminization of poverty and when you're looking at the fact that a significant number of women cannot afford legal representation is then women then naturally turn to the system that exists that is legal aid. And one of the challenges that I think many of the, this group of women have in accessing legal aid is the fact that the eligibility criteria sometimes makes them not quite able to access that free support, quote unquote free. Um, also that some of the um, identification that's required, some of the requirements around bank accounts, some of the requirements around language that isn't necessarily always met to ensure that women can fully complete the application for the legal aid process to begin. We also know that, yes, there are free legal advice services that are available for those who are marginalized and who may not have the resources to purchase legal advice, but we also know that there are limits to the, um, to the capacity of that service, but also the competencies that that service is oftentimes um, provided with is largely English. So again, it compounds a barrier, it creates a barrier um, for some women. And also that the half an hour consultation period that it allows for, the, for these group of women who are multiply marginalized and who may not have phones, may not have a place where they're staying where they can access private conversation to have in fact that kind of consult, um, is one can say that yes, the service is available, but we need to question whether or not it's accessible to this group of women. Duty councils, as we know, are swamped, and as I indicated, in terms of the, some of the sometimes the initial police intervention can range from a dismissal, from filing a report, ridicule, um, challenging the competency and credibility of some of these women based on sometimes the fact that there is mental health issues, and also sometimes based on the reality that some of these women who have come forward are women who have themselves been in conflict with the law at some point or another, and also are women who are seen as compromised because they might be involved in sex trade. Just signaling then what are some of the actions and strategies that we can begin to talk about when we have the open kind of floor conversation is I think there's a need and a continued need for the justice system to do and continue to do education that provides a real integrated analysis around violence against women, around how that is situated within the justice system processes. And as, you know, I think in terms of to, you know, to bring one of your authors to the floor, Constance Backhouse, um, where I think she poses the challenge around questioning the neutrality of the law and that the law is built on and comes and re results from 
uh, some societal frameworks that has impacts on it. So therefore, how the law engages the discussion around violence against women is certainly going to be informed by the social context within which it's situated. I think the other kind of commentary that I'd also offer is that within, and not to say that lawyers who are already in the process are not doing what needs to be done and are not capable of change, but I think that there needs to be also um, insistence in the educational programs whereby young, and by young I mean newer lawyers who are coming to the profession, are coming to the profession with some of the more specialized training that was not initially part of the curriculum, of the legal curriculum that many of us are now sitting with. So that's kind of another commentary that I'd put there. Um, I would also say that lawyers who are committed to utilizing the court system as a vehicle for social change must also be at the front lines of taking on the defense of these groups of women so that there can be fundamental change and implications for public policy, but also that there is a development of a body of case law that um, judiciaries can use to facilitate their decision making, but also that we can use to facilitate our appeals. Um, I think it's also imperative that lawyers who take on cases representing marginalized women and women who are marginalized in some of the ways that I've identified build connections with community-based supports. Because I think one of the challenges I hear consistently is that we're not social workers. And the women who come with these multiple challenges are, require more than just legal advice and legal counsel. They also require emotional support. They also require a different level of um, advocacy that you may not be able to provide as lawyers and therefore the necessity to see community-based agencies and service providers as partners in that process. Um, and really seeing that as central when you're working with this, these particular um, groups of women. Um, the last two comments. Um, greater investment in community-based legal clinics, as these are the places that people who are marginalized turn to as the accessible sites for legal counsel. These are also the places that continue to struggle with more than manageable caseloads, um, increasing demands for service, and also, ironically, these are also the places that are sought as advisors for the institution to, um, to offer and to bring support around how they also manage some of the cases in the more um, kind of non-community based um, legal processes. So, we're ta so, so th this group is taxed at both ends and I think there needs to be some greater investment there. I think the last comment that I'd also just kind of put on the table is that legal aid is the source um, that many of this group of women turn to as their way of beginning to access um, justice systems. And this is a group of women who I would say the, the time that is needed with them to develop their case may be greater than the sometimes the cap limit that's put on the legal aid certificates that's available. So I would say that there is a challenge to legal aid to do some um, community specific targeted initiatives that can make its process more accessible and make it more accessible and more responsive um, for this, these marginalized groups of women accessing um, justice systems, though they may not get the results that they want, I think they need to have a fair chance of putting and building their case to put it forward for fair assessment. So those are my brief comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Angela. And now to you, Mary Lou. I'm going to speak to you about uh, women's advocacy in the criminal justice system. 
and Angela has really captured the problems in a nutshell, and I hope what I have to say isn't repeating too much of what Angela has, has said so well. For women's advocates, violence against women is not simply a reflection of women's inequality in our culture. It is a vehicle employed at an interpersonal level and condoned at a systemic level that maintains women in a position of inequality. Since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into effect, into force in 1985, women's advocates have used its equality provisions to assert women's rights to freedom from gender-based violence. Through interventions in a number of cases at the Supreme Court of Canada, women have asserted the right to equal protection and benefit of the law under Section 15, translated largely into the right to fairness in the criminal trial process, the right to security of the person under Section 7, as a, as a basis to protect women from unwarranted intrusion into their past sexual histories, and the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure under Section 8 as a basis for assertions of privacy interests in their confidential records. Violence impacts on all aspects of a woman's life, particularly curtailing her engagement in those aspects of life, mostly education and employment, which largely determine our standing in society's social order. Similarly, it curtails the enjoyment of family and social life, activities that also define one's social value in our culture. Of course, violence not only exacts an enormous personal cost in terms of women's economic and social achievement, but takes a significant toll on her psychological and physical well-being. It is important to note also, as Angela has described, that violence as a system by which women are prevented from achieving equality cannot be understood as distinct from other social political conditions such as racism and poverty that disadvantages particular women. Women who are poor, marginalized, who suffer from mental illness, women who are from visible minorities, who are non-English speaking, who are disabled, women who, who are young or elderly, who are immigrants and refugees, who are Aboriginal or who are lesbian, are all more vulnerable to violence. And because of systemic racism, homophobia, sexism, and other entrenched oppressions in the legal system, these same communities of women face multiple barriers to justice when they seek the protection of the criminal law. Women's inequality in the justice systems mirrors women's social inequality in our culture at, law and vi and at large and vice versa. Women aspiring to overcome violence in their personal lives face inequities in the justice system that undermine those efforts. Women's vulnerability to violence is thus increased. Women's inequality is thus further entrenched. Let me touch for a moment on the scope of the problem. <clears throat> Stats Canada reported in its most recent report of 2004 that 27 percent of all victims of violence in Canada uh, were victims of family violence. And of that number, 62 were victims specifically of spousal violence. Young females <coughs> aged 25 to 34 experienced the highest rates of spousal violence, while rates of family violence against older women increased by 42 percent between 1998 and 2002. A 1991 study done by the National Family, the National Family Violence Study uh, found that 75 to 90 percent of all Aboriginal women in northern communities experienced domestic violence. With respect to spousal homicide, the highest risk was experienced, again, by younger and common law spouses. Seniors murdered in a family context were murdered most often by their spouses, 42 percent, and or, or by their adult sons, 37 percent. With respect to the treatment of offenders in the criminal justice system, Stats Canada reports that over one-third of all convicted violent offenders were spouses. Only 19% of violent spousal cases resulted in prison sentences as compared to 29% of non-spousal cases. Probation was the most common sanction in cases of spousal violence, occurring in 72%, 72% of all cases. Over 50% of victims had a reported history of domestic violence and 52% of offenders had previous criminal records. In 1995, Lorraine Greaves, a University of British Columbia professor, in her study, Selected Estimates of the Costs of Violence Against Women, estimated the total annual cost of violence nationally at $4.2 billion. Government bears the largest burden of the quantifiable costs at 87.5%. Lost tax revenues annually due to wife assault is in the neighborhood of $1 billion, $406 million and another 102 million is lost due to the incarceration of offenders. The cost of incarcerating and supervising offenders who assault or kill their partners is $290 million a year. Policing costs are $187 million per, per year. 
Physical and psychiatric health costs are in the range of $400 million per year. And government pays about $508 million per year for social services. That is for shelters, counseling services for abused women, and a variety of prevention and other initiatives. Individuals themselves suffer about 11.5% of the cost of partner assault, according to Greaves. Lost net earnings due to immediate injuries are in the range of $7 billion annually. Lost lifetime net earnings at $23 billion. These statistics dramatically underscore the enormous dimensions of lost opportunity and women victims' disadvantages in competing for society's privileges and benefits. These economic estimates have to be considered, of course, along with the unquantifiable human costs, such as pain and suffering and loss of enjoyment of life. But taken together, the collective losses paint a landscape of disadvantage and inequality attributable solely to the prevalence of violence. The criminal justice system has not traditionally served women well. Law enforcement has been inconsistent in its effectiveness, conviction rates low, and sentencing inappropriately mild. While provincial governments have attempted to address abuse of discretion by police officers through such things as mandatory arrest policies, and have established domestic violence courts and policies relating to more vigorous prosecution of domestic violence offenders, the overall performance of the criminal justice system has still not lived up to expectations. Police still do not respond appropriately or in a timely fashion to requests for assistance. The overall arrest of offenders has increased, criminal charges are still not routinely laid, even where clear evidence of assault exists, and protection orders are still not consistently enforced. Racist, sexist, and patriarchal views within police culture persist, making it difficult to make effective systemic changes. At present, there are a number of particularly problematic issues relating to police intervention in domestic violence cases. One such problem is the alarming increase in the numbers of battered women that are being charged and arrested by police. Immigrant and refugee women, particularly those without status, are in danger of being reported to immigration authorities and subsequently deported if and when they contact the police for protection from abusers. This in addition to the legal repercussions that such women face in the immigration system when their sponsorship by their abusers breaks down makes the hurdles to justice and living free of violence almost insurmountable for this group of women. Aboriginal women and women of color still face the likelihood that not only they but their partners will often experience harsh and racist treatments by police and by the criminal courts, and such women are therefore reluctant to seek criminal justice intervention in their family situations. Women with physical disabilities and elderly women are reluctant to report violence in part because of the dependency on their abusers and caregivers, but when they do, they are often dissuaded from pursuing criminal prosecutions because of credibility issues. Poor women, homeless women, and women with psychiatric histories or mental health issues are ignored and often suffer derision and or further abuse at the hands of the police. In addition, the advocacy of the criminal defense bar in resisting victim-oriented initiatives in the criminal justice system has been a constant source of distress. Efforts to protect women from disclosure of confidential records is an ongoing struggle. Women who are sexual assault victims have made more inroads in this respect <coughs> through equality-based claims to privacy of personal information, but battered women have not yet achieved the same level of protection. Battered women are still subjected to abusive cross-examination in criminal courts and are often advised to settle for such things as peace bonds rather than prosecution of their abusers. Domestic violence courts have been designed to more vigorously prosecute offenders and to be more victim focused. And while improvements have been made, their effectiveness is still uncertain. Diversion of offenders to offender counseling programs is prevalent despite the uncertainty of those programs effectiveness. Sentencing of, a, of offenders is inappropriately low in domestic violence cases. In the last analysis, it is chiefly important that the criminal justice system be fair to all who have an interest in the system, whether that person is the victim asserting her constitutional rights to equal treatment under the law, <coughs> the accused who asserts his right to make full answer in defense, or society at large who possesses an interest in the de deterrence of crime. These various rights must be understood as legitimately coexisting and not as hierarchical. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be accepted as a vehicle for all equality-seeking groups. However, in the foreseeable future, overcoming the entrenched belief that in a criminal trial, a defendant's rights always trump those of the victim or society will still be an uphill battle. <clears throat> as for the role of lawyers, as I mentioned at the outset, over the last 20 years, lawyers have advocated for justice system reforms and have used the Charter to advance women's equality goals. They have advocated for greater participation for victims in the criminal justice system as a whole 
and are increasingly advocated, advocating particularly for an increased role for independent counsel for victims in criminal trials. The role of independent counsel in the criminal trial process is a radical concept in our modern age, not interestingly in ancient times, and is a concept vigorously resisted by traditionalists in the system. Independent counsel currently play a role in representing women on motions for production of confidential records. In that, ca in that context, counsel for the victim may also seek the permission of the court to curtail or control cross-examination of the victim and or may play a role in advising the victim on the legal qu consequences of refusing to answer any particular questions under cross-examination. In the future, lawyers will increasingly argue for women victims to be, to be protected from abusive cross-examination as an equality right, particularly those cross-examinations that undermine the truth-finding function of the trial. Independent counsel <coughs> will, also, will increasingly argue that the disproportionate experience and impact of violence against women is a discrimination issue requiring more profound equality-based redress by the criminal courts. These arguments are traditionally viewed as undermining the rights of the accused and reconfiguring the criminal trial process from a state individual contest to a contest in involving additional interests. But women's rights to fairness in the criminal process should no longer be viewed as in conflict with accused rights. Women advocates have focused their advocacy on the elimination of procedural and evidentiary rules that were inherently abusive and discriminatory and intended only to subvert the fact-finding role of the trial. Women's advocates may also play an increasing role in ensuring that victim impact statements are properly before the criminal courts on sentencing hearings and or may represent women victims in those rare cases where they are cross-examined on those statements. Suffice to say that the role of the independent counsel in the criminal trial process will be a significant emerging battleground between women's advocates and those representing criminal defendants long into the future as women increasingly demand fairness in that forum. As well, women lawyers will continue to play a vital role in criminal law reform, as they did in the reconstruction of the sexual assault provisions of the Criminal Code in 1983 and in the drafting of the new Rape Shield Law in 1992. They will represent the interests of victims at national parole board hearings. They will represent public interest advocacy organizations at inquests into the deaths of battered women, as they did in the May Isles and Hadley inquests. And they will represent the interests of battered women and other numerous non-litigious forums such as the Provincial Death Review Committees, Police Domestic Violence Advisory Committees, examining such things as mandatory charging policies uh, and training standards for police on domestic violence issues. Similarly, they have an important role in committees charged with evaluating prosecutorial processes, policies, such as the no drop policy, and evaluating the domestic violence courts as a whole. As well, women lawyers employed in nonprofit organizations like mine will also play, continue to play a critical role in the provision of summary legal advice on criminal justice issues for women who are victims of violence, in advocating with police, prosecutors, and corrections personnel on their behalf, and in the design and delivery of public legal education forms for battered women and the community at large on the criminal justice system. Lawyers and advocates for battered women also maintain a role in the media, commenting on significant cases involving violence against women. And lastly, lawyers can ensure that through the construction of their legal arguments, the intersecting oppressions experienced by many victims of violence are acknowledged, understood, and addressed. As for lawyers who are legal academics, they have historically and will continue to develop the theoretical analyses that form the basis of legal argument and activism. Last, lastly, let me just say on that note that women lawyers have a lengthy and rich history of collaboration with academics, activists, and service providers in the community who work with female victims of violence. As Angela has indicated, this this relationship has to be further, much further enhanced. But this collaboration has greatly benefited both the lawyer and the academic who can learn from the real life experiences of battered women and the activists and service providers who learn about justice system processes and effective justice system advocacy. Lawyers will continue to play a central role in creating legal processes that best serve the interests of victims and that will hopefully someday lead to the eradication of violence against women. Thank you. I was on a panel a few years ago with uh, Charles Roach, who many of you will know is a very famous uh, and well-regarded uh, lawyer in Toronto, who is a black man who was called to the bar in, in the 1950s. Just even sort of processing that has always been interesting for me, what it must have been like to be a black man trying to be a lawyer in the 1950s. And he described himself as a movement lawyer. And he said the movement part of that was far more important to him than the lawyer part of it. The lawyer part of it was a means to an end. 
and the end, of course, was to seek equality. He also said something that has really stuck with me. He said, do not kid yourself that what you do as a lawyer is morally neutral. He said, what lawyers do is to help the rich become richer and the powerful become more powerful. That's what lawyers do. So that's the framework that I wanted to start from. Um, I was glad that Mary Lou gave you some statistics. I'm going to give you some statistics too. Uh, and I, I want you to be... And I want you to be patient with the statistics because they're quite powerful and they really also are a framework for this discussion. Women actually report uh, that they've been assaulted or abused to the police only about 26% of the time. So the vast majority of assaults by their partners are not reported and are not otherwise recorded in the system anywhere. About 30% of women in Canada who have either been married or lived in a common law relationship have been subjected to either physical or sexual abuse from a current or former partner. And interestingly enough, that uh, data, 30%, is consistent with research in other countries, including America, Australia, and New Zealand. One third of women who were assaulted also feared at some point for their lives. About half, of the women, about half of women who are separating or divorcing have experienced assault by their partner. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. In fact, the violence almost always escalates at separation. And the, the most distressing thing about the story that's been on the front page of The Globe and, and other papers yesterday and today is the banality of the story to those of us who work in the assaulted women's community. Um, in, in cases where women are assaulted or abused, uh, during separation or divorce, um, in about a third of these cases, women report that the level of violence increased in severity dramatically after the separation. In about 40% of, of uh, relationships where there has been violence, women report that their children are witnesses. And in fact, the assaults that children are likely to witness are more serious. The data tells us that. More than half of all women murdered in Canada are killed by a spouse or intimate partner. And here's a chilling number. In Ontario, one woman a week is murdered by her partner. I want to talk a little bit about language and why language matters and why I'm unhappy that this <laughs> session uses the, the descriptive domestic violence. Um, this is a gendered crime. This is a crime that is overwhelmingly committed against women and uh, overwhelmingly committed by men. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't violence in lesbian relationships, but uh, women who are assaulted by their partners used to be called battered women. I know, I know that Mary, uh, Mary Lou uses that term. The term I use is wife assault. Many in the feminist community use the term woman abuse to have a larger umbrella. Because I'm an, a lawyer and I work in the justice system, I can tell you that woman abuse doesn't communicate to judges what needs to be communicated and so lawyers don't use that word as often as others perhaps. Um, the, the, word, the, the expression domestic violence omits the context of gender from this crime. I also want to tell you a little bit about what wife assault actually is. It usually includes physical violence but not always. Wife assault in my uh, presentation and the presentation of most of the people on the panel, I suspect, refers to any behavior, usually by a man in an intimate relationship with a woman, the goal of which is to control the woman's behavior. Um, and wife assault is a continuum. It's not an individual act. It's a course of conduct geared towards a particular result. Um, uh, it's interesting for me over the years to listen to my clients tell me things like, he hasn't hit me in years, he doesn't have to or I can tell when he walks in the door, there'll be a look on his face, or he raises an eyebrow, or I can tell I'm going to be hit that night. Um, interestingly enough, in all the years I've been doing this, I, I have uh, many, many, many clients tell me that they were assaulted when their husbands were drunk, but nobody has ever told me that they were assaulted when their husbands were high on pot, which is very interesting. <laughs> but, they, but they have said they've been assaulted when their husbands used cocaine. <laughs> So wife assault also includes behavior which isolates the woman. And there's a, a, a lot of information about this. I'm just going to go through some of this quickly so you have a framework for this. Intimidating, ridiculing, name calling, um, unfounded accusations of infidelity, possessiveness, um, isolating the woman from her friends, from her family, from money, um, physical assaults, sexual assaults, threats towards the woman, her children, her family, threats towards things like pets, 
destroying her possessions like baby pictures or wedding mementos, um, stalking. Um, also, the woman is repeatedly told by the man that she is to blame when he hits her. If you were a better mother, I wouldn't hit you. If you were a better cook, if you were a better lover. And soon she starts to believe it. And the pressure on women in our culture to stay in relationships is increased. It's large to begin with, but it's also increased by their financial circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> It's tough to talk about the role of lawyers without talking about what I think of as the prime directive and what we in my office think of as the prime directive, which is making sure that she's safe from the first phone call, from the first voicemail message. Whoever in my firm has contact with her, whether it's one of the secretaries or it's me or one of the other lawyers, all my staff are trained to worry about, are you somewhere safe? Where are you? Does he know where you are? Are you safe? Also, I want to confirm for you that the assaulted woman is you. There are definitely assaulted women in this room, and if this were a room full of men, there would definitely be men in this room who hit women. This, is, this happens to women at all levels of income, from all cultural backgrounds. Uh, women, assaulted women come from Forest Hill and Rosedale and Regent Park and Riverdale and Cabbage Town. The shelter workers in Ottawa often tell that the wives of cabinet ministers come to the shelters. So you, you cannot look at this crime and imagine that it does not happen to you or people of your socioeconomic level. And assaulted men are, you know, respected professionals, judges, lawyers, doctors, teachers, the hockey coach. How are women treated in the justice system who are assaulted? Pretty shabbily and not much better now than when I first started practicing in the late 70s. Judges still ask two incredibly stupid questions. One, why did she stay? And two, did he hit the kids? Why did she say, stay is a kind of a subtle, indirect way to communicate that she can somehow control the, the relationship or control the violence in the relationship. Um, you know, the right question is, why did he hit her? Why does society allow men to think it's okay to assault the women in their lives? Um, and I'm going to talk to you about did he hit the kids, because I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. I also wanted to talk briefly about advocacy and law reform as a job for lawyers. Um, the day-to-day, -day, you know, we, we work for assaulted women in many ways, partly in the day-to-day -day work that lawyers like me do in acting for assaulted women in our family law cases and in... Um, other cases that involve assaulted women, but also we do it in the lobbying and activism that we do in the community and with governments and police and other agencies, pressing governments to draft legislation that takes, uh, you know, violence against women into account in many ways, including in determining custody and access of children, responding to draft bills, um, and, you know, lobbying for funding. This is not easy work. Mary Eberts described this work as, uh, water dripping on a stone, which over time makes a difference, but uh, really results in small changes. I can tell you that when you do this work, you need to redefine success. Um, I'm kind of an impatient, uh, cranky little person, and I used to think of success in terms of revolution, which means that I wanted to flip the table over in meetings. But now, I, as I am getting older, I realize that you can also experience success in terms of evolution in affecting change as deeply and quickly as you can under the circumstances. Um, this work in family law is very difficult work. It's uh, always litigation, acting for assaulted women. It's almost always a custody case. It's almost always a disputed custody case. And it's not necessarily because the abuser is interested in custody of the children. It's in part because the abuser knows that this is a very effective strategy to get her back. That if he gets the children, she will probably go back. This, <coughs> excuse me, um, this litigation also, unfortunately, often replicates the, the dynamic in the relationship. Abusing men hire lawyers who are willing to uh, conduct the case the way they want, with a great deal of litigation. litigation. They spend a lot of money, they bring a lot of motions to court, um, and remembering that the goal is to get her to come back, often she is exhausted without financial resources, it's affecting her parenting, and she just packs it in and goes back because she can't take it. Um, the notion of the woman going back is also a very challenging one for some family law lawyers. Uh, I had a whole section on mediation and arbitration and assessments, but I, d I can't get to all of that in 10 minutes, so 
um, the courts are still not a very friendly place for assaulted women. And I'll go back to the stupid, stupid question number two, did he hit the kids? Now, that's a really interesting question because that makes it sound like it's okay if he hit their mom, but it's not okay if he hit the kids. Um, for a long time, it was the, the justice system looked at these cases from the perspective that men who hit their wives actually did not hit their kids and therefore it was okay, you know, it was okay to hit your wife. But the research actually says otherwise. Um, and abusing men who gets no treatment will continue to abuse in other relationships. Children who witness their mothers being assaulted actually experience the same symptoms as children who are themselves assaulted. Also, the data tells us very strongly that these kids grow up, the boys to be abusers, the girls to be victims of, of assault. Um, there was a, a study of children who lived in a shelter that reported that 25% of children in this particular study reported that it would be okay for a man to hit the woman if the house was messy. 25% of ch those children said it would be okay. However, after attending group counseling, none of the children thought that that was okay. It, there's beginning to be some case law coming about which considers the effect of wife assault on the best interest test for determining custody, but it is small and slow. It's the water dripping on the stone. Uh, and judges still talk about assaulting men as having anger management problems, which is ridiculous, rather than identifying this as criminal behavior, which should have criminal consequences and, contact and consequences in the family law case. Um, it's very difficult to get women who get restraining orders to be willing to enforce them. And restraining orders are not very successful in the family law system, and in fact, Feminist advocates have lobbied the government for about 20 years to come up with something better to uh, some other kind of protection order to assist women. Was, I was interested to hear Angela talk about lawyers who are committed to the justice system as a vehicle for social change. You know, lawyers who do this work pay a price for doing this work. We pay a price in terms of our standing in the legal community. We pay a price in terms of our incomes. Not that that's the most important thing, but it is the way, one way that our society measures worth or value. Work that you do for women is undervalued and underpaid. I had to laugh. I was at a, a seminar where an American academic was talking about, in, in glowing terms, how wonderful it was to be a lawyer because you could actually do well by doing good. And I said to him, no, you can't. You can either do well or do good. Thank you. Well, what I'm going to talk about is basically um, a summary of what everybody else has talked about. And since uh, the reason we are here today is to honor International Women's Day, I would like to tie what I'm going to speak about in a more global sense. Um, and in the time that I'm allowed to, to speak, I like to talk about mostly about refugee, immigrant, and non-status women who are victims of domestic violence and their challenges in the legal system in general, and more specifically in immigration refugee law domain. Um, and I'd like to tie that into how lawyers as human rights advocates can use international human rights instruments to advance the cause of their clients. Um, to begin with, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Angela spoke about, and that is women abuse and uh, immigrant refugee women and their experiences and some of the barriers that they face. And I've done this in point form so I can be very quick and we can have a better, uh, more time to have uh, of a discussion. Some of these um, barriers that uh, immigrant and refugee and non-status women experience are such things as cultural and language barriers, fear of having their children kidnapped to another country, fear of being sent away or deported without their children, which is a very real fear in, in our society here because of um, uh, the immigration laws and how men use immigration status as a weapon. Fear of their confidentiality won't be respected if they seek help fear of the police and the legal system in general, isolation within their own community as well as the larger society, lack of interpreters who can sign in languages other than American Sign Language, lack of family or friends nearby who can offer support, lack of knowledge of programs and services for abused women, lack of physical accessibility and accommodation. I need a little help. Thank you. 
uh, racism, stereotyping, homophobia, and ableism in social and legal services. And some other challenges that specifically are faced by immigrant, refugee, women, and non-status women as far as it involves in their uh, legal uh, problems is, for example, such things as post traumatic stress disorder, which is a very real issue in the immigrant and refugee women and non-status abused women um, community. Lack of ability to communicate or use uh, her abuse as a basis of her legal application. And uh, what I'm talking about is women using the abuse that they suffer as the basis of, for example, their humanitarian compassionate application, or using uh, domestic violence as a basis of a refugee claim, or a claim uh, not to be removed to their country of origin. And that's a very big barrier. And I think there's also in the, uh, there's a lack of skills from some um, legal service providers that are out there attempting to assist women who are immigrant, refugee, or non-status women. I think some of the skills that are needed um, in um, legal service providers are such things as patience, because women who do not speak English or French um, and communicate in a different way, you need to have patience to actually sit and talk to them. Empathy, uh, being able to put oneself in another person's position, being non-judgmental. Understanding cross-cultural uh, modes of communication. Uh, understanding boundary issues and being able to deal with vicarious trauma because if you're dealing with a group of clients who are continuously are talking to you about their um, traumatic experiences, it's very important to know how to deal with that yourself. And the respect for choices made by your client. For example, not making decision for the client and giving control back to the client. Um, in my opinion, uh, working for the last uh, five years with abused women, I find that a lot of women lack control in their lives. And a woman without status, for example, has put all the control um, of her life in the hands of either her abuser or immigration officials. So it's really important to give some sort of control back to the woman. Since um, domestic violence is prevalent all over the world and in all sectors of Canadian society, I, I believe though that the impact on those women without proper immigration status, it's uh, disproportionately more severe because they, uh, they base other legal barriers who um, women who have status in Canada do not face. Women who lack status in, in Canada have um, issues of lack of access to the police, and I think uh, Mary Lou um, uh, touched upon that, but that is a huge barrier, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it um, down the line. Um, such things, legal barrier, um, as the UN Convention on, um, on Refugees in Canada since uh, 2002, um, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act has decided that a person who comes into Canada has only once in a lifetime chance to make a refugee claim. And that is a huge barrier for women who, for example, have come here with their partners who were the main applicants in a refugee um, application and they're victims of domestic violence. And let's say if their application was denied they don't have a right to make an application on their own behalf anymore. Um, there are such things, another legal barrier is uh, the new well, and this is a barrier for most immigrant refugees, but I think it um, affects women and children mostly. Um, the new safe third country agreement that has just come into um, uh, law between United States and Canada, which states that if you're coming over land from United States, you have to go back and make your refugee claim in the first country that you've landed. And that has been, um, I think that is going to be as the years go by, because this just came into effect in December, last Last December is going to be a huge barrier for women, specifically women who are coming from Latin America because they come over land. Um, and also, uh, when women pursue legal action, they're often faced with a hostile criminal justice system, as Mary Lou and Angela spoke about, and rules and regulations in immigration law. Uh, examples I can give you are, um, for example, the misrepresentation clause in the Immigration Refugee Protection Act. This is a clause that states that if you have said anything that is untrue or you have forgotten to say something that you didn't even know you had to say, your status can be taken away from you. So men are using that. I've had had clients who are landed immigrants actually in Canada whose um, 
who have left their abusive partners and their husbands have gone to immigration and said, she married me to get into Canada. This wasn't a real marriage. So immigration comes after the woman to take away their um, landed immigrant um, status. Uh, such things as sponsorship breakdowns because you have women who are sponsored by their husbands to come here and they have to be with them for three years. And that, that kind of a dependency is very, um, very controlling, and as well as women who are here who are undergoing sponsorship, who have not received their sponsorship yet, and they feel that they can't leave their abusers. As I said, refugee claims, once in a lifetime rule, and also the ability to be able to, if you are a refugee claimant with your husband, to be able to separate your, your claim from your, hus uh, from your husband, it's, it's difficult, and basing your own um, uh, claim on the abuse that you've suffered. There are new abandonment rules at the Immigration Refugee Board, which men have been starting to use to control their wives. For example, if um, a notice comes in in the mail that uh, a woman has a refugee hearing, uh, a lot of men have started to not give the notice to their wives, so their claims have been deemed to be abandoned, so women become out of status and they have deportation orders against them issued. And there are other issues such as, um, the new pre-removal risk assessment uh, claims that are coming up and evidentially burden on the women trying to uh, bring forward evidence of the abuse that they've suffered in Canada or overseas. I think that women from marginalized communities may be particularly reluctant to press charges or act as witnesses having little or no confidence in the outcome of interaction with the police and the criminal justice system and women in, in Canada may not report rape or, uh, or partner violence if they're without status or if they think their abusive partners will be deported. Uh, for immigrant and refugee women experiencing partner violence, a key component of their survival in Canada is access to justice. And as I said, this access begins with the police, which unfortunately are not trusted by many members of the immigrant and racialized communities. And as Mary Lou uh, very quickly mentioned, the police practice of double charging or counter charging is seen as a dangerous trend and a major barrier for women to seek help. It involves the police charging both the male and the uh, woman victim if they're uncertain about the circumstances. And if uh, under the new Immigration Act, if you have um, criminal convictions against you, you can also be deported from Canada. So that's a huge barrier for women if they're being charged. <coughs> Furthermore, women without immigration status who have overstayed their visas and may have a warrant for their arrest under the Immigration Act would be detained by the police and handed over to immigration authorities even if they are the victims of partner abuse. And in my work, I had many um, women who were arrested uh, when they tried to um, access police. For example, I had a woman who was in an emergency um, division of a hospital and the police came and arrested her and took her to detention. Um, there was a client that um, the police came actually to the shelter and took her to immigration detention. So these things happen and it's a huge barrier for women who don't have status in Canada. Um, and again, therefore, as Carol mentioned, uh, violence against women is characteristically underreported because women are ashamed or fear skepticism, disbelief, and further violence. And I also think that gender discrimination that women face is combined with other forms of discrimination leading to marginalization. So women from racialized communities, Aboriginal women, lesbians, bisexual, transgendered women, women from immigrant communities or minority religions, and women with disabilities face such multiple discrimination. Now, having to connect that with what you can do to use some of the instruments that are available, international instruments, I think you have to put it in a, um, in a more holistic sense of why violence happens to women around the world. Um, because violence against women is a human rights issue, it's a discrimination issue, and because violence against women is a form of discrimination, human rights um, are universal rights of all people, and therefore you can use violence against women um, and use that as a human rights abuse um, um, argument. Because women from different countries, from diverse religions, cultures, and social backgrounds, educated or illiterate, rich or poor, whether living in the midst of war or in times of peace, are united by the threat of violence, often at the hands of the state, the community, and more importantly, their own family. Therefore, lawyers representing women who are survivors of domestic violence should try to incorporate international human rights instruments in the advocacy of their cl cl uh, clients. Um, Unlike, and I think using international stats is very good. Uh, for example, the Council of Europe has stated that domestic violence is the major cause of death 
and disability for women between the ages of 16 to 44, and accounts for more deaths and ill health than cancer or traffic accidents. The World Health Organization has reported that up to 70% of the female murder victims are killed by their male partners. Um, the Rome Statue of International Criminal Court, finalized in 1998, included several forms of violence against women, including rape as war crimes and crimes against humanity. Therefore, gender-based persecution has been included as crimes against humanity, and states are required under international human rights to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights of women. So Canada is a signatory to all these conventions. And I think also reference to international law can be helpful for women survivors pressing for improved medical, housing, and social services to help them achieve recovery. And lawyers working as advocates for women survivors in legal proceedings should try to use international human rights instruments such as um, the UN Convention on, on the Rights of the Child, uh, the U, uh, UN Convention um, on Torture. Um, I, I've, I, in my practice, I always used uh, international conventions um, in my submissions to the Re Refugee uh, Board as well as uh, doing my hum uh, humanitarian compassionate applications. And to me, I think that uh, using UN conventions such as, um, and I, this is the one I always used, UN Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is a candidate as a signatory to, to lobby municipal, provincial, and federal governments to implement the laws that remove barriers to access to justice for women and promote equality rights of women. Lawyers in Canada, specifically immigration lawyers, in the last 10 years have used the Convention Against Torture and Convention on the Rights of the Child in courts to advance the case of immigrants and refugees. And now these two conventions are entrenched in the new Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So it's kind of like a trickle-down theory. You know, if you keep on using it and using it, maybe you'll, you'll get through. Um, some of the international human rights instruments that I think are useful are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, they all cover women. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, conventions, as I said, on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. This is a very good one to use in refugee claims and pre removal risk assessment claims. Declaration on Elimination of Violence Against Women, which defines gender-based violence. There's a good definition in there that is very good. It talks about any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely, likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or in private life. So I, to use that kind of an international uh, definition, I think, is, is, uh, is a good thing. A Convention on the Rights of the ch Child in your humanitarian compassion applications and pre removal risk assessments. Um, and also, the, of course, the UN Convention um, on Refugees, which was ratified in 1951 and its protocol in 1967, uh, which is part of the Canadian law now. And the 1993, um, uh, there is um, a gender guideline that was developed in 1993 by the Immigration Refugee Board that I, have, I recommend for all refugee lawyers to use on domestic violence. It includes um, issues of domestic violence, uh, female genital mutilation, sexual assault, rape as, as war crime. And we can, if we can talk about that, it's a very interesting um, guideline to use. It's not law, but it's a guideline, and I think it's important to use. Um, another good declaration that I always love to, I've wanted to use for many years, is the Declaration on Human Rights of Individuals who are not nationals in the country in which they live. And I think that's a good one to use for women who don't have access to the police in Canada. Uh, and these are women who are not nationals of Canada, who are aliens, as they're called. Um, so these women, uh, you could use this uh, convention to try to assist women to uh, access uh, the police. Um, and there's also the Inter-American Convention to Prevent, Punish, and Eradicate Violence Against Women adopted by the Organization of American States, which provides an individual right of petition and a right for non-governmental organization to lodge complaints with Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And I think uh, lawyers can assist women to do that. And in an overall scheme, there's the 1995 Beijing Declaration on Women, which Canada is signatory to, which Canada promised, and they report every five years about all the laws in Canada and whether there's a gender analysis in every single law that is passed in Canada. Um, 
and it's interesting if you read the report that was done in the year 2000, uh, and 2003 actually, and the person from Department of Justice who spoke on the Immigration Refugee Protection Act and how they did a gender analysis. I was involved in trying to actually represent uh, women's issues in front of the parliament when that was going through, and you can believe me that none of that went through, and they're, they're reporting on it to the UN. So. Um, <laughs> I think it's important to be able to, for lawyers to understand and try to use the international instruments. In conclusion, I think that human rights standards are the bare minimum of what every human being should be expected to enjoy in their daily lives. Um, they provide an internationally recognized and legally enforceable benchmark. Lastly, um, I had a list of things that I thought everybody should think about, but I'm not going to go through it. It's about going and lobbying parliamentarians to change laws that affect women. I think we can talk about some action plans uh, in a conversation when we talk. But I'd like to talk a little bit about in the continuum of, at the end, of what happens to women around the world since this is International Women's Day. Um, I don't think we should forget why uh, I think everybody on the panel spoke about power and control and how it's a global issue. I think we should think about the women, uh, for example, rape of women in Darfur, I think it was a, a uh, uh, an article in the Globe and Mail on the weekend talking about um, how women in refugee camps in Darfur are being raped, um, the Iraqi women being raped in the streets of Baghdad, marital rape leading to AIDS and HIV in Africa, and many more examples right in Canada as we spoke about. Um, and I think violence against women takes a dismaying variety of forms, from domestic abuse and rape to child marriages, female genital mutilation, dowry burnings, and on a continuum to sexual harassment in the workplace. So it's a continuum and I think we should speak about it in that sense. Um, in the end, I think uh, my thoughts are that the scandal of violence against women continues at least in part because of the world's apathy about an appalling human rights abuse. Violence against women like slavery and torture in early centuries is often seen as natural, normal, inescapable and acceptable. Like slavery and torture, violence against women is none of these. As with slavery and torture, progress in eradication violence against women can only be made by understanding the human rights abuse for what it is and condemning it publicly as well as taking action against perpetrators. Thanks. Thank you very much to all our speakers for um, covering extremely broad topics and um, within their timelines. Um, we now have about 40 minutes for a discussion, so I will invite uh, questions from the floor and invite our panelists to comment um, on each other's presentations if they wish. So are there any questions from the floor? Yes, at the back. Thank you. Wow. Um, those are very large issues. Uh, I was <coughs> speaking at the Linden School last week, actually, and one of the students asked me, if you could change one thing in the justice system, what would you change to make it better for women? 
And my answer was the same answer I'm going to give you, is that women are not equal in Canadian society. So until women are equal in Canadian society, the justice system is in some ways the least of our problems. Um, so that's a, that's a very big picture issue. Um, women who have family law problems need to find a good lawyer. They need to find a lawyer who's knowledgeable about family law, who's knowledgeable about the dynamics when relationships end, who's knowledgeable about abuse and assault, who's willing to follow their instructions, um, who accepts legal aid if that's an issue, and I know that's a great challenge. Um, and if, if uh, the lawyer you want doesn't accept legal aid, this is the, if you're fighting over your children, this is the one time in your life that you go somewhere and borrow the money. You go to your parents or your sister or your best friend and borrow the money for it. So I, I, the answer to your question would take two hours. <laughs> I agree with you that all those issues are hugely problematic and they are places where women's inequality is, is worked out in a in a justice construct every single day. Any other questions from the floor? Yep. Um, I'd like to hear um, Sue um, you know, sort of call to action. But the other thing I'd like to know is um, how do we go about um, getting zero tolerance for violence against women in our society? What's, what are the steps that we need to take to make that happen? Well, going, I think, from your last question, I think attitudinal change is really important. Um, and I don't know, I think that comes over generations. And, and I think understanding what violence against women means <coughs> and what, it, what the root causes are, I think that's really important. Um, and I think that looking at violence um, in a context, as Carol was talking, of the society and, um, and understanding that it happens for a reason. It's not an isolated issue. It doesn't happen only with crazy people. Uh, you know, somebody who throws their kid off the bridge is not because they're crazy. It's about power and control. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if, you if that is brought into <coughs> the psyche of society, uh, understanding that power and the power structures in the system, um, I think that would be one of the first steps I don't know how you would go about doing it. My issues that I had that were basically on what we can do um, in trying to change laws um, that affect women adversely. And um, also looking at what happens to women in a more holistic way um, and understanding that if you want to change things, it's not always through just laws that there are other ways that you can change things. And um, my call to action, um, you know, was such things as lobbying ministries and local authorities to improve services, particularly <coughs> emergency and long-term housing, medical care, social support. Because if women want to leave abusive relationships, they need to have support systems there for them to do that. And if it's not there, they're not going to leave and they're going to be killed. Um, uh, access, secure justice uh, to access to justice and recovery following abuse. Because as Carol mentioned, most of the abuse happens after after you leave um, an abusive relationship. Um, bringing cases to court on authorities who fail to secure rights for women in practice. I mean, these are very lofty. I mean, ideas. But if you could think about. Um, in charter issues, um, when you have laws that are discriminatory against women. Um, harnessing the media to promote progressive messages about violence against women. Um, I think advocating and discussing the causes, as I said, and costs and solutions to violence against women in local communities, addressing both men and women. Because if you just are talking to women, it's not going to work. I think you need have both. Carol, would you like to add something? Yeah, just, just a, a small issue. Many of you in this room are lawyers, or some of you in this room are lawyers, which means that you are enormously privileged women. Only 6% of Canadian women earn more than $60,000 a year. Only 6% of Canadian women earn more than $60,000 a year. So you need to 
make women's charities a priority in your giving. Shelters and the National Association of Women and the Law and Sistering and all, all community organizations. You know, we all do some charity giving. Get out your checkbooks. I mean, this is where you are needed. I have, I have a question at the back first and then I have a question at the front here. Uh, Mary Lou or Angela, or both? Well, there, there are <coughs> many complex reasons why women wish to uh, remove their abusers from the criminal justice system. Um, there's a, a range of reasons, from fear of reprisals, repercussions, if the, uh, the, threat, the threats and intimidation that may be inflicted on them by the abuser, or by his extended family, or by their own extended family. Um, wish, hoping that, that to, to, to assist him to get out of that system will protect them from further violence by him at some point. Understanding also the inadequacy of the criminal justice system that's really not going to probably solve a lot of their problems. Uh, economic dependencies, of course. Um, the, the isolation that women feel, the need, um, societal value of fathering in our culture, which is, of course is reflected very much in the family law system. Uh, there's a whole range of issues. Um, and for those women, um, what they really, you know, don't need is, is so much as education as it is support um, <coughs> to have an individual who is capable of uh, understanding those complex issues, uh, processing those issues with women, and being able to either provide or refer them to the services that will support women in those situations. Um, you know, those, those kinds of resources are found in social services in Toronto and the women's community in particular and in and in uh, many professionals who in the, um, in the area of uh, uh, psychology and, and, and medicine other place who also are feminists committed to working with, to, to support women in those positions. But um, it's not, uh, it, it's something that shouldn't be interpreted as women being masochistic or, um, you know, was so, so much supportive of their husbands as it is the, the helplessness and disempowerment that they experience in those relationships. And I guess I would just add the connection and the implications for women who have been abused and the kind of the psychological and emotional impact of, tra of that kind of trauma. And I'll just use the example of um, some of the women who we serve. So there are women who have been chronically homeless, um, living in the hostel and shelter system and or sleeping outside. Um, as a housing worker in our agency, we work to get the women housing. So women now have the housing and women cannot bring themselves to be indoors, to be in the, in the space that is their own. So women return to sleep at the hostel and we ask the question similarly, um, well, they have housing, why is it that you know, we've worked so hard for, for them to have housing and here it is that we've given it to them and they just won't go in? And or here is it that we've created shelter beds and here is it that women just won't go inside? So in terms of I think there's a corollary around the impact of trauma and that when we talk about issues of violence and abuse and we talk about violence against women is that we need to not just look at the provision of the basic needs, but then we also need to look at what are the kind of emotional supports that women need to revision themselves out of victimology. Um, and I think because oftentimes it is that place that women hold as themselves as worthless and all of the other traumatizing impacts that bring them back 
um, to circumstances of abuse and violence, even in subsequent relationships. So, 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 I, so, so I think we need to also be cautious about how we ask the question that could be perceived of as judgment um, after we have done so much to provide for you to leave and here it is that you throw it back in our face and you've returned um, to circumstances of abuse. So I think we really need to also look at the issues of the implications of trauma and violence on the psyche. Thank you. I have a question at the front, a question at the back, then a question at the front there, and one at the side. So people are lifting their hands while I'm keeping track. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead. Okay, I have um, just offhand. Do you happen to know what percentage of Canadian men earn more than 60,000 a year? <laughs> no, don't. I, I, I mean, I'm sure that data is available. But, but, but to be honest with you, I don't care. What, what, <laughs> what, what I care about is that the, ma the vast majority of Canadian women earn less than 60. When I have a woman client in my office who earns more than 60, I tell her that. And I know that she doesn't want to hear this from her lawyer, but I tell her that she's privileged and that even though she's separating and going to be a single mom and going to have a different standard of living than she had when she was married, that she is better off than 94% of Canadian women who are struggling and starving with their kids in very difficult circumstances. I also just want to add to that, you know, that it, 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 when I look at charitable, the patterns of charitable giving at the Schleifer Clinic, it doesn't really take much for a woman to be giving. You would be surprised at the number of checks we get for $5 from poor women who say, yes. I want to make some contribution. Um, and yes, there are the checks for Five thousand dollars, but there, but it's rarely <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> from people who generally could afford a check for much more, more than that. More. But um, mm -hmm. but the checks uh, and the, and that kind of financial support from women who have no money is in, is incredible and is very inspiring. And of course, women are always offering volunteer services of various sorts. Women who don't have money. Okay, I, I actually my more important question is a hobby horse I've had for years. It's ever since. The media started referring to women as girls, girly this, girly that, um, everybody's a girl, and it, it made me sick. And I want to know if you think the coverage of women's rights or women's non-rights has gotten worse in the past few years. Can you see any change at all in how these things are covered? How much attention the kind of stats you tell me about are getting in the media? Well, um, by, I think by way of beginning a response um, is just midday today, Judy Rebick was on CBC um, being introduced. Judy Rebick, the former um, president of NAC, um, National Action Against the Status of Women, um, was being interviewed about the women's movement. Um, what has happened? Where is it? Um, what has been its impact? And I think for me, what she reflected back is that there has been gains made as a result of um, feminist activism that is no longer assigned to that. So there is, a, um, there is an assumption that they have occurred out of pure evolution as time goes by, <laughs> things just change and it changed along and those changes just happen to come along. And I think um, that's a fallacy because we know that those changes were as a result of a number of advocacy efforts through LEAF, through NAC, through a number of other kind of women's organizing which are still present but I don't think are as profiled and the changes that happened aren't are no longer assigned to them and to us as a movement. Um, so as a result, there is the, the, the perception that there is no longer value in a women's movement and or the need for, um, and that the need for building um, organizing bodies around um, women's issues with, a, you know, with clear gender analysis is no longer important because after all, haven't we achieved equality? Aren't we all sitting here? So I think that there is still a media 
um, I think, perception and or portrayal that equality has been achieved, and I think popular culture has, has facilitated some of that. Uh, I'm, I, sorry, I'm going to take the questions from the back and then I'll come back to you. Um, so we have a question at the back. Who would like to? Mary Lou. Well, I, I, I think uh, going back again to, and Angela said this quite clearly, that, that there is a need, and Sudebe said the same thing, to have an integrated analysis of oppressions <coughs> and discriminatory uh, conduct um, towards any identifiable group of individuals. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've struggled, I think, in the women's movement over the years to understand the unique experiences of discrimination that are encountered by women with disabilities. Um, I remember years ago being a group of women and trying to do family law reform, and we were trying to figure out if there was a, a rule of law that we could come up with that could replace the, the best interest test for custody determinations. And I think that the rule we had considered at the time was the primary caretaker rule, that if you're, you know, women, and the reality is that most women are primary caretakers of children, and if you're the, pri if you can demonstrate that you're a primary caretaker, um, then you should, there should be a presumption in favor of custody of kids to you. But at that time, a group of women with disabilities came along and said, no, that, that's not a rule that will work for us. And in fact, that would do the opposite. That would further entrench discrimination against women with disabilities in the family court system. Uh, I have a friend who's an academic who always says, when in the, in the process of developing equality theory, uh, you must test it by asking, who does this theory harm? Uh, not so much who does it benefit, but who does it harm? And I think that as we make legal arguments, develop equality theory, make legal arguments in any legal form, whether it's family or immigration or criminal, we have to test those theories against who it harms. And we have to test our developmental processes for inclusivity who is included and who, or who is excluded from the processes of developing legal reforms. Um, so that, that's just that's this the first step. Um, and, and we don't still don't do that consistently. Uh, but we I think we are developing better and more integrated analyses of oppressions. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I have a question in the second row, I believe. It's okay. Um, question to the left.
Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I have a yeah. couple. Yeah. Well, well, this, sorry, this lawyer has actually walked herself around the question. Yes. In, in other words, has, has in some ways answered the question, yes. which is actually what we're trained yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 there's, a couple, there's a couple things I want to respond to. Um, I, I am unafraid to confront this issue with my clients, and I am unashamed to tell somebody who's in denial, you are an abused woman or an assaulted woman. And frankly, it's a piece of news that nobody wants to get, right? Um, and they will, they will argue with me about it. No, 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 it's not that bad, it's not that bad. And I, I remind them that this is my day job, that I've been doing it for a long time, that I've acted for a lot of women in their situation and that they have the right to live without this violence or without this intimidation or threats. What most women want is not to end the relationship. They want to end the violence. If the violence stopped, many women would stay because this is somebody they love. So it's very challenging for women because they cannot control that. They can't change that. They can't end the violence. Only he can end the violence, right? So, so that's a big hurdle. Um, some of the things that the, this lawyer mentioned, you know, deal with sort of vicarious trauma, like with how damaging and difficult it is for you as a service provider to deal with people who's, whose lives are so problematic and traumatic and how frustrated and inadequate you feel when you can't fix the problem for them or help them fix the problem. You know, in those situations, as I said, I'm, I'm, I ask every woman I deal with if she was assaulted. Every single woman, either on the phone or in the, in the, uh, rece in the meeting uh, with them. Because you know, a large number of women have never told anybody and are, have been in denial, as you've said, have been completely in denial. I ask then if they say, no, they've never been assaulted, then I take it to other <coughs> levels, abuse or intimidation or anything. So that they need to, the reason I call my firm a feminist firm is that I think of it as a place where women are safe and comfortable and where their issues matter. They matter to me. And I might be the first person who cares about those issues, and so might you. So don't think you're not doing a good job. You need to keep raising these issues. And you're right, you need to offer support and offer their services in the community. You need to find out if she's safe, how can I help you be safe, do I need to go to court? There's a whole list of things you need to cover. But the truth is, many women go back, and they need to not be criticized when they go back. They need to understand that when they go back, and I, I say this to all my clients who are going back or I suspect are going back, you will leave him at some point if the violence continues, and I'm here, and you can come to me again, and I don't care, and I will not judge you or be angry, and in fact, I'm ready. I have the court papers ready to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm ready, it's in, especially with computers. It's in my computer <laughs> because the, the vast majority of women who are assaulted or abused leave many times before they actually leave finally. So this is very complicated work and situation. I just, um, on that issue, what you were talking about, I think you have to also um, look at the boundary issues there. Because if you are becoming so involved in your client's uh, emotional well-being, you might not be able to represent her as well as you could. And I think that, um, because I, in my experience, uh, it's important to refer them to people who are actually equipped to be able to help them with their uh, emotional needs. Because you're there to advocate on their rights, right? Um, and I think you have to look at, I think women who come from different cultures have different views about how to use, um, how to use their language to express um, what's happening to them. So I don't know the base clients that you have, but in my experience of working with uh, refugee and immigrant women, um, having to talk to them about what is abuse, because a lot of women don't even understand what right. if they're being abused. Because, so you have to define it for them. It's like, um, 
is he uh, not giving you enough money for food? Are you allowed to go see your mother? You know, because a lot of women don't see that as abuse. They see that as part of being normal family dynamics. Um, and specifically in some communities, uh, uh, because of isolation, because they feel that if um, they name the abuse, they are ashamed in their communities. It's really important to have that understanding when we, when, as a lawyer, when you lead deal with those kinds of issues in those communities. So there is the boundary issue and the vicarious trauma and not taking on the abuse yourself. Because I think in my experience of working <coughs> with women, as Carol said, lots of them went back to the abuser, but they always came back. It took a year, maybe six months, five years, but they came back uh, because they needed to get the support. So it's important to be non-judgmental and just um, be there. So. And just before we maybe move to our next question is I'll just add the comment that women, we know when we're being mistreated. So I wouldn't want um, the perception that maybe women from different cultures and or different communities um, because they don't identify the, the word abuse is that they don't know that there is mistreatment happening because I think that then can feed a whole other kind of analysis and perception of the backward immigrant um, who um, is so accustomed to abuse and violence that she no longer knows when it's happening. And then it can lead us as providers to take on a really paternalistic um, role in then how we provide advice and support. So just wanting to add that as a compliment um, to the previous commentary. We have 10 minutes left, and I have a, I know all the people who have lifted their hands, they're written down here. I have a question here, then here, then there, there, and there. <laughs> so we will try to cover all the questions in the next 10 minutes, so I will let you ask your question. Twitter lawyers with me here laughing, Carol said 60,000, because the reality is, is that 
on legal aid, which is most of the women abuse cases that will be handled, you'll handle if you do, if you do women abuse will be on legal aid, and uh, it's a struggle to make it. Of over course, 50. of course. I know. I mean, you mentioned it. I, I, I hope that nothing that I said communicated that I think the judges get this. I, I mean, <laughs> well, the question is, how do we get through the okay. women judges, and how do we get through the new? There's a new breed of women lawyers who are coming in the ranks who are, are nasty and nasty and unsympathetic towards women issues. Okay, I want to go back to the judges. Um, you know, when I was first in practice in the late 70s, it, it, it wasn't very fashionable to make these arguments. In fact, it was decidedly unfashionable to make these arguments. And lawyers who, d who did make these arguments were subject to a lot of ridicule and criticism to make arguments about you should take it into account when you decide in custody the fact that he beat her up, right? And so at that time, you, you, when you start your practice, you need to make a decision about whether or not you're going to do this highly political work. Frankly, all family law work is political work, but this is highly politicized, this work. I, I said this earlier, I'll say it again, you need to be unafraid. If you're going to do this work, you, you need to be unafraid. Yes, your reputation matters, and yes, it matters what judges think of you, but it also matters that you fight hard for what is right and that you protect those who need protection. Just go back to Charles Roach. Just go back to remembering what Charles Roach said. So, um, do I think the judges get it? No, I'm the one who said they ask two stupid questions. Um, <laughs> Do I continue to make these arguments? Yes. Do I take flack from the judges? Sure I do, just like everybody else. But it doesn't stop me from making it. And in fact, I have said to judges who said, why did he hit her? I've actually said, that's the wrong question. <laughs> the right question is, sorry, who judges who said, why did she stay? Sorry, I, the right question is, why did he hit her? You know, and yes, it does embarrass judges and some judges have crapped on me over it, but that's okay. It's worth it. I'm a big girl, I can take it. Whereas my clients can't, my clients have had it. So I'm not suggesting that all lawyers are prepared to do this, but, and I'm not suggesting that I did it with this kind of strength and confidence and outspokenness when I was a baby lawyer, but I'm an old doll feminist and I'll say whatever I want to <laughs> at this point in my career. And I want to urge, urge all of you to remember that your job is to be an advocate if you're acting for women in these situations and to make these arguments. It also points out, Marty's comments point out the importance of having women who are judges, the importance of having feminists who are judges. The, you know, just even in really little things like, you know, tuna doesn't cost 37 cents. A can of tuna costs 380. And if the person who's hearing your case hasn't been shopping for tuna in the last 20 years, they don't understand how much children cost. And I actually learned that from my own father, <laughs> who wasn't a judge or a lawyer, but he would constantly pick up a, a tin of tuna and say, this is a 45 cent item. What do you mean it's three bucks? <laughs> We're back in the front. Okay. Uh, if I can, sorry, oh. if I can just sorry, add Richard. that, I think we, we, there was a conversation started earlier around kind of influencing broader systemic change and um, seeing the judiciary and the criminal justice system as a process that sometimes reflect back to us some of our horrid norms. Um, and I think that when we look at issues of advocacy and when we look at issues of building alliances is that there are some powerful places that do have influence. Um, but they don't see these issues as some of their strategic issues. So I see recently, and we also recently, the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association. There is a cost for violence that we heard about. It's how do we get and how, do we, how does the OMA begin to take on these kinds of questions that can um, locate in a public conversation, in ongoing conversations about the nature of violence, the impact of violence, and its ripple effects, um, because I don't think clearly in terms of judiciary education is you know, what's going to miraculously change that. But I think um, in terms of pressures from other places that begins to be in concert about the fact that violence against women is not okay. And it might seem rather ridiculous to just say that and it just seems so simple and not impacting. But I think 
when many people say it from different places that have never been that have never said it before it does resonate and i think we need to try and get to some of those places so they can begin to say that at the front Never turn down. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot of shy people here today. Oh, well, not up here, there aren't. <laughs> I'm having trouble getting airtime up here. <laughs> Nobody in this room should turn down a chance for a media interview where you can speak up for women. Don't be shy. Just go ahead and do it. As women's voices are heard more, and women's faces are seen more on TV, that's when we're going to get our power back. It's nuts and bolts. Uh, Mirin. Okay, my first question was what Marty asked for the judges, and uh, I had one horrible experience, and after that, I don't want to enter a family. I, I was just with a client, and mm -hmm. I was shouted at, and maybe even though it was because I said it for the client's consequence, because I was in tears, mm -hmm. and I was being asked uh, if I've ever done law, if, uh, if I've practiced. I mean, it was just all about me suddenly, for no reason, I was just accompanying a client. So it the nastiest, nastiest. Well, there is the International con uh, Hate Convention on taking children out to different countries if you have donor custody. It's a kidnapping charge. But, you know, for female genital mutilation in Canada, it's against the law. There is a law in Canada. And um, for, um, I know that when my clients who used to come to me and their children, um, they wanted to go overseas, they always were trying to get custody orders. Without a custody order, they should not be able to take children out. So what if both parents are taking the child mm -hmm. abroad? And the child oh. is scared and, you know, more like Well, there's a convention that. on the rights of the child where Canada is a signatory to, which I was talking about. Um, and I think um, if the child wants to, and I'm not a family lawyer, but if the child wants to on her own, is that the one? Is on her own to petition the court not to be taken? Actually, I have, a, I have a separate suggestion, which is, and it's far from perfect, but it's Children's Aid Society. Um, you know, ch children do tell a teacher or their, ho their hockey coach or whatever that they've been physically abused or sexually abused and, or tell, you know, a friend who tells their parent, and that's how Children's Aid Societies get involved in families to begin with. Um, I'm not aware of children's. I'm not aware of any uh, reported cases that Children's Aid has been involved in um, taking custody of a, a young girl to prevent female genital mutilation or forced marriage. But it certainly is right up their alley, and it, it's absolutely something they should be doing because those are not Canadian cultural norms, and that one of them is definitely against the law. And probably we could, we could get a decision from a court that said forced marriage was against the law as well, especially because these are all underage marriages, right? Hugely underage marriages. So it, once Children's Aid gets involved in a family, it's very, very difficult to get them out. And believe me, I act for a lot of parents in Children's Aid Society cases, so I'm, I'm not saying Children's Aid is a wonderful answer, but perhaps it is a place to go on these, these difficult issues, because these are generally intact families you're talking about, 
where you know the, the, the children have no say at all, where the children are not being allowed to become Canadian children or Canadian teenagers, for example. So that is a way out. If the children can tell somebody, doesn't have, you know, they don't have to call Children's Aid, but tell somebody who will tell somebody who will tell Children's Aid. The next question is at the back. No, but that is the response. That is the wrong question, and it's the wrong question for these reasons. So if you're, if you're a family law lawyer working in this area, when you go to court, you need to have those answers ready. You need to have, you know, I can say it without a written script, right, <laughs> because I've been saying it for years, but you need to have those answers ready. That's inconsistent with the data, Your Honour. The data shows that children who witness violence suffer, you know, the same effects as children who are assaulted. That's the Peter Jaffe stuff, the, you know, the psychologist in uh, London, Ontario. There's, there is a lot of data about this. And, you know, when you first start making these arguments, maybe you need to go to court with a little binder of material so that in case you have to hand it to the judge, you do. Look, at, I'm not saying this is easy or fun. This is hard work. And fighting with judges is really hard, and it's hard on your career. And the woman who spoke earlier about having a bad experience in court, I, I know from Sudebay that she's not a lawyer, but don't you think lawyers have burst into tears because they've been treated shabbily by judges? Lots. We have lots. All of us. Everybody. So, you know, you just need to be tough. I'm going to take the last question here, uh, Judith. Frustrations that you're feeling are the frustrations that all lawyers feel who work in this area. And it's important to arm yourself with the tools and, you know, the power and control wheel that you can give your client that shows what an abusive relationship looks like and what a healthy relationship looks like. The simple things like that and referrals to agencies. And it sounds like you've got some uh, people here that are going to also assist you with some tools and strategies. And good for you. The, the last thing is um, the uh, judges don't get it. And the judges get it sometimes, but generally they don't get it. And the one thing that struck me in listening to our discussion here today about woman abuse or spousal abuse or whatever you want to call it, is that we tend still, and so do judges, to talk about it in terms of battery physical abuse. And those of us who work in this area know that that's only one element. And the, the tragedy of emotional and verbal abuse, financial abuse, and sexual abuse, but the emotional abuse issues are huge. And that's where the intimidation, the control, all of those things come into play. And it's very, very difficult to argue those things because they're so um, difficult for people to get their heads around. Women who go to agencies that, that counsel these women will tell you that I didn't realize 
realize that's what was happening to me <laughs> until I heard about it and saw it on the uh, power and control wheel. So we have to educate judges that they must take all kinds of woman abuse seriously, not just. It doesn't have to be just battering a physical incident that they pay attention to. It's all the other stuff that's equally important. Why don't you say one more thing? I, I know that it's not a room full of lawyers, but there are some younger lawyers in the room who could definitely use a mentor in this area. And there are a lot of the lawyer organizations have mentor programs, the Bar Association, the Advocate Society, I think even the Law Society. Um, I, I have two lawyers in my office other than me who, who do also do on, only family law. You know, please call me. I'm not saying I can be your mentor, but I can help you find somebody, okay? The Law Society also has a mentorship program, so Rudy Dixon right there is, uh, <laughs> is the coordinator of our mentorship program and we'd be happy to help. There's also been a request on that note, Carol, there's also been a request from a person in the audience, for any uh, lawyers in the audience who would like to leave their names and emails to follow up from today's uh, meeting and compare notes and perhaps develop some other strategies in law, please feel free to come up and write your name down on a piece of paper and we'll uh, connect with you. Um, we have to close, but I, there is one question. Yeah, that's not a small question, and I don't think I will take this one. Um, I think we really do have to close. The, the Boyd report could be the, the subject of a full panel discussion, uh, so I'm sorry about that if you want to uh, talk to our panelists after the, the discussion. Um, before I thank our panelists, I would like to invite all of you to um, Convocation Hall, which is right there. Uh, to a reception um, and Minister Sandra Pupatello, who is the Ontario Minister for Community and Social Services and Minister Responsible for Women's Issues, will be our keynote speaker. So you are welcome to that reception. Um, and now I would like to thank our panelists. It's been a fascinating discussion, I think, and it's a, a discussion that we are beginning, but it's certainly not a discussion that we are ending. Um, I also have Elisa Gamas, who is the president of the Women's Law Association of Ontario, who would also uh, like to offer a token for, from, from the, uh, the association. <coughs> There's one for me. Yeah.